Welcome to the Peerless YouTube. I am Katie North and today we are painting Rust. So this was one of the tutorials requested off of our Instagram post a while back. So if you ever see that again, make sure to comment and post what you would like to see because they do get added in. And this one was so cool. So I did a practice painting and I absolutely loved it. So I was a little nervous to recreate it, but over this few months, six month journey with Peerless, I have just realized, it's so cool, is that I've like more understood my process and I've had to break them into teachable ways of demonstrating it for you. Uh, and I used to be an intuitive painter, so I would just kind of sit down, have a you know roundabout idea in my mind by the painting was finished, it looks completely different and not anything when I first imagined it would be, but being able to, to teach and to understand my process a little bit more to better explain to you has helped me be able to kind of, I feel like gotten a, a better painter and then also just, you know, understanding my own process. So I, I don't know, I thought I would share that with you. It's kind of cool. I really appreciate working with you guys and this painting turned out so awesome and saying thank you so much for suggesting it because it's, yeah, it's really cool. So let's get started and I can't wait to see your paintings. All right, so we're gonna get started today. We're gonna jump right in and we are going to sketch out our rope uh, chain and then also that little back sign that's on the door itself. I picked this painting because I absolutely love the colors between the turquoise or the teal and the kind of the burnt oranges and the dark browns. It is Kate Davidson's photo from her Flickr account and I absolutely love it, so thank you. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna sketch it out. I did not make a paint palette for this tutorial just because I wanted to have a lot of paint available and usually sometimes when you make the paint palette and you cut the little squares you don't have enough paint and I knew from my practice paintings that I'm working with it very wet and kind of it needs to work a little bit faster so I just wanted to make sure I had the full sheet of paint available to me just if I needed more I don't have to cut it and then retape it and kind of you know do that whole process so that could be something that you can kind of add into your memory bank if you're working on a larger painting. Go ahead and just use the full sheet and just kind of work straight from there. You're not gonna use all of it. You still can preserve the paint, but you won't have to worry about making sure you have enough paint. So, and then yeah, pretty simple. We're only using a few colors and um, the chrome orange, the chrome yellow, and the Bismarck Brown and a, few, a couple different colors of blue. So one of the blues that I had was from my mystery pack and I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but I think it might be the turquoise blue or the sky blue. And then we have that uh, butterfly wing blue too. So any of the blues I feel like would work really well because they all have a little bit more of that tealish color, just as long as you don't pick up one of like the true blue, kind of like, you know, the deep blue or the, Alice blue, like those are more on the blue side. You wanna pick something that's more on that teal to turquoise side. And yeah, so drawing my chain, I'm kind of just measuring the length of each kind of like oval or circle shape, and then just kind of making sure that they're the same sh like length as I'm tr tracing them down onto my paper. And then some of them you can see from the photo are a little bit more rounded and some of them are a little bit more squished. So just kind of be aware of the shapes that you're trying to put down. Um, I do not have a, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, da, 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 da. A photocopy of this, this um, sketch. I forgot to do it, I apologize. But I also was like, I hope this is like going to be the final. Because I did do one practice one, and then I did do a second one a, a little bit different way and kept it a little bit more wet to see if I liked it more, and I did not like it more. So then I went back to this one. So that's why there's no photocopy sketch for you, but you can practice doing the chains. They're little links of circles, and then you're just making sure that you have those overlapping areas to show which one is in front and behind.
So now that you have your chain drawn, we are going to mask out all of the chain area. And you don't have to do this, but it does save you some headache and just kind of time spent going back and forth and trying to get the same colors on either side of the chain so it looks more like a realistic background of the door. This way, when you do your drops, you can kind of have that paint go from the top to the bottom and the negative space of the chain so it looks like that door is kind of all the way the same top to the bottom. Uh, and then, you know, you're able to work on the chains themselves and not have to worry about, you know, if it's it dry, is it wet, all of those, all those little tricks and things that you get with masking fluid, which I do love so much and I haven't actually used as much before this last six months with Peerless. So it's definitely one of my newer favorite things. And salt, salt is quickly becoming one of my absolute favorite ways to get texture. And again, with this painting, it's like the same as the crystal. Like it just like works perfectly with these natural textures and the like, you know, how the metal eats into each other and the rust kind of does it and you get all these weird little speckles. Salt is perfect. So super about it. Um, once you're done masking out your chain, you can mask out the little door sign um, on the back too, because that's more of a turquoise and teal than a rust color. And yeah, I will check back in a minute when you are done with your masking and it is completely dried. So now we're ready to start painting. You're either going to want to tilt your painting up with a piece of paper towel on the bottom with something behind it so it stays up, or like I'm doing, if you have this available, it is a photo backdrop and it worked really well. Um, but you're just simply gonna squirt your, your paper to get it slightly wet. And then whatever blue you're using, you just wanna fill top to bottom that blue color. So you want the paper to be just a little bit wet so when you're putting the the paintbrush down you're not getting any like darker lighter areas but you're able to fill it nicely and smoothly and then once that's filled you are going to use your yellow orange and then bismarck brown in in order so you're going to put the yellow down first and then do your drops and decide where you want them to be dropping from and then when that's kind of eaten up some of that blue color it's going to kind of look kind of not quite yellow but kind of greenish with a little bit of orangey and a little bit of the yellow and then in the very center of those drops you're going to do a drop of orange and then on the center of the orange you're going to do brown so we're kind of working from light to dark so instead of doing it in layers we are giving the chance the paper to get wet and then saturated with blue and then we're saturating a, a nice little area of the orange and yellow and then the darker orange and then the brown so when you're left with it you kind of shows like exactly how rust would eat away at the metal and it kind of gets all of those colors combined and there's no like brush strokes in between and you're letting the fibers in the paper really determine what it's going to look like and i think that's why it looks so organic and natural and so awesome is that you have like those colors blending together however the paper is and it how the um what am I saying? The gravity with the like that the paint actually falling down on itself. That's what's giving the um, the blend, and I think it looks so cool. So also, just with this too, you're gonna want to use a little bit nicer paper. I am using the Archies again, just from I learned from the watercolor pouring that you know when you're saturating multiple times and it's really wet paper, and if you don't want it to get kind of floppy and you know crazy. Uh, a higher quality paper is preferred for this technique. So uh, yeah, and I'll check back in a minute.
And you can see here how much the orange and the yellow have eaten away at the, the blue. So you can get those little green areas and then you're starting to get some of those orange la layers. So this is where you're going to start to get more of those rust colors is this first or this second and third kind of the, um, the, or the chrome orange and the Bismarck brown kind of make it really pop and give it that texture that we're looking for. And then while it's still wet and still hanging, I do little snowflake drops of a very concentrated amount of paint. So I'm going directly from my paint palette to the paper and getting a bunch of little dots as it would give it the texture, how it's eating, eating away in more areas than some, and then those little flecks of color that you get. And then, um, yeah, like right, like right now, I see here. And then just kind of however, personal preference, how you want them. Again, working right from the paint, pa paint palette or the sheets. So they're super concentrated. There's not too much water on there besides the actual paint. All right, so you can see a little bit up close too how cool the paint has moved on the paper and how organic and natural it looks just because you're letting the gravity do the work for you. I think it's so cool. I think it turned out really cool. <laughs> I love it. So again, with my Bismarck Brown, I'm just kind of adding a little bit more of the darker areas, any little speckles that I see. Um, Completely personal preference. As you can see too, I wanted to mention this. So do you see these lines that I'm doing with the darkest brown and how they're not fanning out as much anymore? That's about the wetness of the paper you want because it's not spreading out and making that, you know, those little lines as much as it was. This is almost the perfect amount of wetness your page wants to be for the salt where you're gonna get not the softer blends, but you're gonna get those really small sharp texture pieces that kind of work really well with the um the rust texture so the just about done with this and then i'm going to do my salt cracker in my pepper pepper grinder but with our my pink himalayan salt and then i just do it over not all the entire painting because i want some of the areas to be smooth and not kind of the texture so I do it more over the darker areas and the rust areas but I do try to leave some of the blue areas a little bit more of the smoothness uh, just because I do like what they're doing with the with the blending of the the paints already too so so this after this stage you want to make sure that you leave this painting alone I left this painting alone overnight because I wanted it to be 100% dry again before I take the masking fluid off and I didn't want to smear or rub my paper with the 
salt on it because I knew there was a ton of water on there and I just wanted to give it the best chance to survive after after I did all this work on it. So, and it does, it turns out great. So patience is key, work on something else. If you have more time to paint, do another one and then go back to it when you, um, when you have another moment <laughs> and we'll finish it up. So here I wanted you to see what it looks like when the salt is wet and you're like, oh man, it's not doing anything. It's been on there for a few minutes and you know, it doesn't look like there's much texture. This is where the amount of wetness on the page comes into factor. When it's not soaking wet and dripping, we are gonna see now, you could see, these all these smaller textures that you get from the page is still when it's like kind of barely wet. And then, yeah, like I said, the one that I did that had a lot more water still on the page, it was just totally different and they had a huge, huge texture marks and they were a smoother blend and softer. So if you want something softer, you can know that now too. If you want softer, do the texture or the salt when it's more wet and kind of a puddle of paint. And then if you want small, really sharp texture, you gotta let it dry a little bit until that page is just barely shimmering. And then you put your salt down and then you'll get more of those individual sharp textures, so. Now you're going to remove your masking fluid and we are going to start painting our chain and the back sign of our, our wall, our door. I think it's a door, maybe it's a door. Maybe it's a door that hasn't been opened in a very long time, but anyway. Remove that masking fluid just by rubbing it. Uh, they have also those little eraser things that are, you know, easier and kind of peels it off too. Um, and then we will get started on painting. So we are ready to start painting. We are using the orange yellow, chrome orange, Bismarck brown, and the forget me not blue. You're going to fill up the whole sign on the door with the forget me not blue and then add some kind of maybe some of the oranges in there and then around the little like where the screw is um, it's all rusted out in my reference photo so I'm trying to replicate that I'm using kind of a circle of the orange and then a circle of the brown and kind of you know putting more paint down and using my paper towel to lift some of it off um, whatever you want to do and get a little bit more texture in there but generally this whole thing is pretty much mostly blue and smoother um, but yeah, I will check back when we start our chain. All right, so you're gonna kind of come back to this, um, the door sign once this layer is dry to kind of make it sharper and add the 
the um, the numbers. So don't worry about it being too perfect just yet. And kind of that, you know, you'll be able to shape it up a little bit once it's dry because you're not going to get any sharp lines while it's this wet anyway. So we are going to start working on our chain. So we're going to be doing this pretty much together for getting the most color and texture. Um, so by what I mean is we're going to put the orange orange yellow down and then we're going to put some orange in the shadow areas and then we're going to put some blue the bismarck brown in the deepest shadows and then we are going to do blue on the tops to kind of give some of that that tealy color back into there uh, but for this first step all you need to worry about all the way across fill it up with the orange yellow and I kind of add a little bit of a barrier of white just to kind of give me some just a little space because I'm just used to that with watercolors that is I need to have my little barrier so they don't bleed but the background should be completely dry the only area that part like you probably would want to worry about making that little barrier is on the where the door sign is because you don't want the orange to bleed with that turquoise too that you just did but you yeah, know to the best you can and like that one that line's a little bit thicker just because i know i don't want that orange to bleed into the turquoise so once you have filled up your entire chain with the orange you're immediately while it's still wet going to go back through with your orange chrome orange so the next color darker orange and you're going to do those snowflake drops on all of the shadowed areas and bottom half of the chain. So you'll be able to see in a minute that when I pick up the next color, I am doing the half bottom of the chain in the shadow and then the half bottom of the chain on the top and the bottom of each circle. And you can kind of see I'm working in little drop motions because I don't want there to be brush strokes in this and I really want them to have the natural textures of just moving around the paint and exactly the same this is our darker our next darkest color now in the Bismarck Brown we are going to be doing the bottom half of each chain so instead of doing a swipe kind of brush stroke I am doing the drop snowflake drops just to get more texture and it looks kind of cool, it looks kind of weird. It, it, you're not gonna sh see a ton of definition in this first layer just because it's, it's still pretty wet and we have to let it dry before you get like those really dark tones. But you just can start to see some areas like that was our, you know, where you want those shadows to be. And then the, do I do another one or do I let it dry? I think I do one more with the Autumn's Indigo. So the Autumn's Indigo, when it's mixed with these browns and oranges, it almost looks black. And I love how much pigment's in there and how dark and rich you're able to make it. So those are going to be all of our shadows in this painting is the Autumn's Indigo. And then you can do a little bit when it's still wet, but then you're, you're not gonna get those nice crisp limes again, like I said, until this layer dries and you're, you do the next, so. And then, let's see, what do I use? Oh, okay, yeah, so I use a little bit of the, the Forget-Me-Not Blue, and just in those lighter areas, because I want those to be kind of a highlight anyway, and I just want there to be just a little bit of that tealish turquoise. While it's still wet again, I'm just kind of filling in a couple drops here and there of the blue, just to get some of those green and blue tones on each chain. So the, a little bit of the drops of the Autumn's Indigo 
And then at this point, we are going to do the salt again. And this one doesn't need as long to dry because obviously the entire paper is not a wet, but definitely give it 20 minutes, something like that, 20, 25 minutes. And then you'll get all of those little textures and organic textures on the chain. And we will check back once this is dry and we have removed the salt for our shadows. All right, so the salt has been removed, just brushed off the paper. You shouldn't have to worry about it too much if your paper is 100% dry then the salt just comes right off with your hand and you could just brush it away. Uh, and now we are going to do our shadowed areas in Bismarck Brown and just kind of trying to build the roundness shape of the chain. So you can kind of follow along your reference photo or just follow along with me. But generally the bottom half of the chain and then the chain that's overlapping it, you're, the one beneath that is going to be much darker and to kind of create those shadowed areas. In the next clip video, I zoom in a lot more so you can see a little bit more in, in detail how I'm doing all of these shadows too. So a little bit more zoomed up, a little bit more easy to see. So while that Bismarck brown, brown has already dried, I'm doing those speckled snowflake drops in the shadowed areas just to stay with that same kind of texture. And then just trying to make the chains kind of pop out. So when the chain is be behind or beneath, I'm trying to make a little bit darker, but still in that round shape of the chain. So it pops out a little bit more. And I'm using the Autumn's Indigo now, which is the deepest, darkest color. I'm going to, uh, what else do I do? I outline the nameplate on the back side of the door and then add the phone number, or not the phone number, but the number of the door. Um, yeah, just kind of working slowly. And it is still a little bit wet on the chain so that I am able to get those snowflake texture patterns, which I think keep keep with the same texture of the whole thing. And then the next step, we will be working on our, our highlighted area.
So I spent a lot of time looking at my reference photo and I, I just, I loved how the white looked kind of speckly and not in like perfect clear lines and you couldn't see exactly where it ends. And then I was like, oh, that kind of looks like, you know, a like a pencil. And I'm like, oh no, duh. <laughs> so I had my white pencil and I feel like it just makes the perfect effect of that kind of eaten away rust look instead of just using just like the white gel pens or anything like that. I do use the white gel pen and my white ink too, just to like re-highlight some areas and kind of like a, like a, you know, a solid highlight. But this kind of speckled look really works really well with the pencil and totally just looks like eaten away rust chain. So yeah, just a white uh, pencil. I think this one's Prismacolor, um, the brand, but I'm pretty sure any of them would probably work. And yeah, if it's a little bit not as sharp, you're gonna get kind of that wider kind of speckly areas. And if it's more of a sharpened pencil, you'll get a little bit more of a cleaner lines too. So little mixed media with here. And then I go through and add a little bit more a step like clearer white highlights with my my white ink as well. So you'll be able to see that. But this is pretty much the end. Um, I love how it turned out. I hope you enjoy this painting. And if you guys try this at home with a, your different, even with a different rust um, reference photo, I would absolutely love to see it. And yeah, I kind of just kind of rough up the page a little bit. Like, you know, the like the texture is so cool that you can just kind of put it a lot of places and I kind of smear it in with my finger a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's totally, totally works perfect. And I love the, the pencil highlight. the the uh, the amount of highlights that I'm doing with the actual um, ink is very minimal like I'm just trying to get the little speckled areas too but a little bit more of like an opaque brighter white than the pencil um, but yeah I think it worked I think it I think it works perfect and you know how much I love my white highlights I just they're like my favorite thing so uh, yeah and this is the completed rust study chain and door. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe and share with your friends and we will see you next time.